Hi, I'm Todd Reingold, the hopeful aspirant. Welcome to another installment of I Got a Testimony. Today I have with me John Demers. John is a local filmmaker and producer, director, all the above. But as I just told him, I'm not going to do a really long introduction because we have a lot to talk about and we're going to cover all that in our interview today. But I want to welcome John to the program today. John, how are you doing? And let us know your testimony. I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, I want to thank you for having me on, Todd. Um, I know we go back a little over 10 years. There's a lot of great things and great moments that I've had in my lifetime, but I've had them because I'm here. And I emphasize that because if you're not here, you don't have opportunity for anything. People reach the bottom in different ways and it affects them differently. Mm. Especially whatever it is that might make you feel like you hit bottom. Uh, for some people, it's substance abuse, alcoholism, uh, learning about a serious medical condition, losing their job, um, losing a spouse, losing a child. Whatever it is that makes you feel like you've hit rock bottom, when you are there, there's nothing anybody can say around you that really makes you feel much different. Certainly there are people that may be around you that can truly show compassion. Um, they might be family members. But if you're not receptive to that and you don't see it because of where you are in your own state of consciousness, in your own mind, it becomes very, very difficult to find any way to feel as though you can lift up and out of the hole, the darkness, uh, the cloud that you're under to, to feel like you have hope, uh, to feel that faith might impact you or do something good. I had an experience that brought me to those levels. It was a long time ago and I still deal with it. But, and, and hear me, I'm still dealing with it, but I'm here. And so that dark period in the early to mid 1980s, which came about because of an extremely traumatic event that took place when I was in the military, something that I was a part to and witnessed. So traumatic was it that I left the military um, with less than two years of service. And yet for many people who have read the work I did, they go, oh my gosh, I wouldn't have done that much in two tours. But it was the nature of the work. I, I went into the military to work in the intelligence community. And when I finished my technical training, I was detached from the Air Force and assigned to the National Security Agency. I was not 20 years old. And so at a duty station in Italy, um, a traumatic event took place. Um, and I won't go into the details of that because I'm actually writing a memoir of my life and part of my family's life. And it's actually in there. But the event was, was very bad. It was very rough. And when I got home, I didn't realize the impact that it would have on me because of my, my inability at that time to... Uh, what was it in the early 1980s? It was like, uh, well, you know, everybody wants to, at least in Raleigh, everyone wants to get out of school and college and get a job at IBM and wear a white shirt and a tie, you know, because IBM was it, you know. Um, I, I, no, that was not, I had no desire for any of that. I couldn't, I couldn't focus on going to school, couldn't focus on my family, uh, me, my my parents and my brother, um, I'm in my early 20s. I wasn't married yet. Uh, 
and I spent most every day trying to figure out how I ended up at 20, 21, 22 for several years where I was at, which was nothing was happening to me. My parents were starting to become frustrated because I wasn't going out and working or getting a gainful employment of any real kind. I didn't want any structure. And so looking at the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years of my life, I just felt like, no, it wasn't going to be that way. Right. And so <clears throat> about that time, it was about 1982, I made my first attempt to kill myself. And I failed at that too. Uh, looking back at that first attempt, I can see where that really had me reach out. In the meantime, I met someone who became my first wife. And so I kind of thought maybe I had a chance to have a life by marrying someone and having a family and moving forward. Not addressing the trauma, not addressing having wanted to kill myself, but in a sense, continuing to have a mask in front of me and trying to let someone see the better part of me and not get too close to me on a personal level, which is tough. How do you become involved with someone and romantic and marry them and not have them become personally close to you? And this person was, I don't wanna say they didn't believe in God, because that would not be fair. I, I, I really don't know the answer to that. And I believed in God, but I also believed that for whatever reason, he had decided to not, not help me or do anything for me. We had no faith in our marriage. There was no, no, no sense of something stronger than ourselves. And in that process of that marriage unwinding, you know, and coming to its end, I decided to barricade myself in the house and uh, get my gun. And since I knew I wasn't successful at killing myself with sleeping pills and such, I thought, well, I'll just have a shootout. And, uh, and my wife came home and saw me all set up. She tried talking to me and then made a suggestion that I call a phone number. We called this person. The lady came and we saw each other several times over the next several months. And she got me to where I understood that my relationship with God was mine. And that reinforced that part of my upbringing, which was the loving and the good side. You know, it seems like almost every religion has good and bad and there's the evil and the good. And in that period of time, the dark, I didn't want any darkness because my whole world was dark. And then I, I was introduced to pot as a possible way of dealing with my depression. Mm -hmm. And, and it started to help. And so I became a closeted marijuana smoker for a number of years, <laughs> but I stayed alive. And then by staying alive, little pockets or nuggets, the good things in life started to happen. For a short period of time, I ran a limousine company. I then started a cinnamon roll business out at the flea market. And then I went into state government. Um, I had run into someone in a grocery store while I was working my cinnamon roll business who was running for political office. And uh, we got into a conversation and he asked if I would help with his campaign, like anyone that needs volunteers, you know. But when he got elected, uh, he, he asked if I would, you know, come to work. And in about a year, I did. And so I worked in the Secretary of State's office. I couldn't see myself staying there forever, though, because once again, when I'm around people for extended periods of time, up to that point, I would become concerned that they might realize that there were things about me that I didn't want people to know. That's when I would not have a lot to say. And that's when I would start finding a way to not work there 
leave a place, start another business, do something. Hmm. In 95, I re-met my current wife. Um, I had met her briefly in the early 80s. Uh, I forget, I think it was at a party. And, I had my, and my wife was with me at that time. You know, so I'd met her before. And she was married at the time. In 96, we got married. And I left state government. And I did not know what I wanted to do. My wife actually said, well, you know, you've done community theater before, which I, I had way back in the, in the 70s. And she said, well, maybe you do that while you figure out what you want to do next. And so that's what I did. I, I literally went back to Raleigh Little Theater and I auditioned for some show they were doing and got cast. And, and, and that and my wife started working backstage and did several shows. And then my kids, as they got older, started becoming mouse ponies. And then my son was a young prince. My daughter was being groomed to be Cinderella. And I started writing and I was doing acting and I was commuting to Los Angeles and booking television commercials. Uh, I worked on three seasons of the West Wing as their precision driver. Again, I've had these, these pockets and bullets. You know, I, I did a show with Paul Servino. Um, I've worked with uh, Martin Sheen. I've worked with... Uh, Oh gosh, Eric Roberts. Uh, I mean, the list can go on. I've got three Emmy nominations for a kids TV show I produced called The Rusty Bucket Kids Club, which my own kids were in. And they were in because the director wanted them, not because of me. I tried to keep them out, but they're really, they were very talented and very creative. And we did three episodes of that, got Emmy noms for it. Um, we're actually still doing some more with it. We're doing a 10th anniversary. We were supposed to shoot it last summer. It didn't work out because we couldn't shoot last summer. So we're trying to figure out when to go back and shoot the 10th anniversary movie. But here's this life that it isn't a perfect life, but I've had nuggets and pockets that now when I'm 60 years old, I can look back over a life and be very grateful that I did not end it in the 1980s. That's the key, yeah. Because don't kid yourself, life isn't perfect. You have bad days, bad stuff happens. But what you wanna do is at least stick around long enough. If you believe that there's a God in heaven and that that God is a good God and that God is full of love, you may feel the emptiness. You may feel the darkness and the clouds overhead. But the truth is, God is in that same space with you. If I died, I wouldn't have Roxana. I wouldn't have my son, John Coleman. I wouldn't have my best friend, Michelle, as my wife. We've had our ups and downs. Mm -hmm but they are rock solid. Mm -hmm. They know I'm their dad. They know that in the end, I've always, when I've fallen down, and when I say fallen down, I have stopped or failed at something. I've not done what I should. Mm -hmm. And that's my responsibility to then get back up, right. acknowledge the shortcoming and move forward. Because in doing that, you allow yourself the next nugget, the next good thing. And, and I'm blessed with my family because in that journey that I've taken, today I am in a place where, yes, I think about the trauma that impacted my life so many decades ago. And all of the time that I wasn't progressive in my life and making my life better and the people around me more enriched because I'm in it. Yes, those were times when I wasn't probably looked at favorably. I know my own parents and my late brother felt like I could have done more in my life. But at the same time, when my brother happened to pass away unexpectedly before my mother, I made sure that I was there for my mom right. and in a much bigger way 
than I could have if I'd had a nine to five job. I couldn't have been there for her or for other people or for other things in my life, raising my kids, being around them when they were young, if I'd have had a traditional nine to five work ethic. When I can sit down and get quiet and pray over where I am, I'm in a good place. Well, that's great to hear. I mean, I, I think that's really what, what it's about is to, I mean, you want to be in that place, regardless of your age, to be able to say, I'm good with where I'm at. But especially when you get older, when you start to see you're on the other side of that hill, you definitely don't want to have a lot of regrets. I try to tell my son, there really are no do-overs. I think when we have our children, that's the closest thing we have to a do-over. And that's kind of the mistake we make is that around 10 or 11, they have their own personality and we have to deal with the fact that they're no longer a mini me and we can't make up for what we did wrong through our children. My son is 15 right now. So he's in that stage where he's really starting to exhibit his own thoughts about things. Spreading those wings. Well, as messed up as that is, because it's scary when they're that age, you see how I don't want to say ignorant, um, but they're just not informed. And they really, they have a confidence that comes from their ego and that tells them they know what they're doing. Even though if you ask most teenagers, how do you, where are you getting this from? How do you know you're right about, I just know. And that's not faith. That's their ego. They're too young to understand faith at that point. I, I did want to touch on the, on the suicide thing for the viewers that, it's a paradoxical thing. So if any, if any of the young people are watching, you know, anyone under 21 or between the ages of say 14 and 25, that's where I think the largest demographic is for people who do take their lives or contemplate it. And just like John, I went through the same thing. I mean, I, I didn't get to the point where I actually did it or tried to do it, but I, I was trying to work my way up to it and never, never got to that point. But I know plenty of people who have And I just want to say this to those that are watching who are in that space. What it is, is that it's your first time or two going through something that's so challenging. For people like me and John, looking back, we say, oh my God, I wish I could be young again, uh, like like you. But you're looking at it and saying, how am I going to do this for another 40, 50 years? If I already feel this badly at 15, how am I going to spend 70 more years in this place. And that's an overwhelming thought that then produces anxiety and panic and drives you to suicidal thoughts. And it's, it's, it's because you have not gone through anything until this point on your own. You've had the support of your family and your neighbors and your teachers. Once you really start to become a teenager and then go to college, uh, hopefully college or, or whatever, but you're on your own, that's when you start to feel overwhelmed. You don't have that immediate support network and you're going through this for the first time on your own. It is overwhelming. But like John said, when you stay in it, if you can just stay in it, you will learn those coping skills. You will start to adapt. And what will happen is once you get through one or two of those major crises on your own, you develop that real confidence and you start to get a wisdom. And then maybe you will seek a higher power because you realize, I don't want to be this vulnerable again. And I'm smart enough now to realize I don't have all the answers. I need to be humble enough. And this is what happened to me at 24. I have to be humble enough to admit I don't know everything. So I better surround myself with older people who do have the wisdom. And I better start to seek a higher power. And that's exactly what happened to me. I always say, and maybe this will come across as a little crass or crude, but it's, it's never the dumb, apathetic people that kill themselves. It's always the creatives, the empaths, the, the kind, the sensitive, the artists, the ones who care about everyone. Those are the ones. I always say I can see other people more clearly than I see myself, but listening to you and what you said, that what it was was you didn't want to commit to something at such a young age because your heart, your calling was not a traditional nine to five, you have a creative spirit. And so that thing inside of you, the Holy Spirit is, was pulling you and saying, no, I don't want you. And again, I know what that's like. 
but there are times when you say, but I, I got to make some money. I got to move out of my parents' basement or I got to, yes. move out, I got to move out of my car. I was in the car for two weeks. I, I, I don't really call it being homeless because you and I probably know people that have lived out of their car for a lot longer than that. But for, for two weeks, I did live out of my car. My pride was such that I couldn't move back home when I lost my apartment in 1981. But then I did move home. I did live down in the basement. I mean, you know, the, for the split level, the lower level. This COVID-19 pandemic really has impacted our youth because they really were in a regiment. I mean, they were kind of like in a routine with their smartphones and their friends and all, and it got completely disrupted. And we are losing these young, wonderful, gifted teens uh, to suicide, and it's and it's wrong. And I don't blame the parents. I'm not. I'm not. This is not a blame thing. But but parents do be alert. Do be aware that this disruption to your work to how you went grocery shopping for a while, your lack of having toilet paper in the house. Let me tell you, look at your teenagers. Be alert, watch them. They're gonna start returning to school, but do keep alert because I, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, because I do know some folks that are in the sort of the senior years of high school because my, my son graduated two years ago from high school. So I still know some of those parents and they had to deal with that this past year. And, and what I'm saying is as they return, the cliques and the groups are different, you know, because even though they're bringing you back in the classroom, you, you know, you're not getting the, the, the club right after school. The sports is being very regulated. So there's still a lot of the downward pressures of not having the kind of social freedom that, that the teenagers expect right now. Right. But remember, there will be a day when you don't have to answer to someone saying you can't do this right now and you can't do that. There will be a day when those freedoms start to truly return. And you will then get a chance to look back on your life like I look on mine and see these nuggets. And then maybe maybe even get to a place where you can look forward and say, I may make a difference. Right. Because with me now, that's where I'm at. For the first time in the last five years of my life, these past five years, I finally sought some professional mental health help because of what happened to me in the late 70s. And in doing so, as I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of writing a memoir. Of, of my life and my family and, and the experiences that I went through that also not only highlight the dark moments, but clearly point out there were better gold nuggets than dark moments. My pan was filled with gold more than it was empty because I stayed consistent and I stayed and I stayed and I stayed. And so now as I'm writing this memoir and I'm talking to publishers and different folks that have been helping me in this part of my journey and they have this history of my life since 96, which is, you know, getting into acting and getting into producing and directing and music videos and, and, you know, film, TV, et cetera. I'm in a place now that this, this novel or memoir will be able to impact a lot of people because I'll be able to now not only have something they can read, I can turn it into a film. I can actually make it make a difference and can do it from a position of strength because for so long, people that are considered to have mental health issues were considered a negative part of society. And yet you, you, you made the comment, the creative people are the ones that tend to commit suicide. That's really because the creative people, I, I don't wanna say, or, I wanna be careful here with my words. Mm -hmm. Creative individuals truly can contribute so much more to society than what we see in plays and musicals and film and TV and the Oscars and the Emmys and the Globes. And I say that because really creative people do much more than that. That's entertainment. Sports is sports. I'm not taking it away from its importance in our culture, but it is 
something that, as we have found in the last year, although we've got plenty to watch on TV because we just got a lot to watch, nobody's been making anything for a period of time. There was really a period of time nobody was making anything. Mm -hmm. But there were people that were creative out there finding ways to work through all this. Sure. The people that created some of the drugs, they were getting very creative in how to solve this problem in a shorter period of time than normally it's done. Right. Then you had the people that got very creative on how can we try to do things? So creativity is not just being an actor or an influencer on a YouTube channel. It is the ability to think outside the box. And the easiest people to think outside the box are the ones that seem to have at times the greatest challenge just living and conforming within what is called society. Right. Well, I, I did want to take this time and I did want to mention that, I mean, we would both be remiss if we didn't, to assume that people know what their resources are. Of course, everyone knows you can call 911 when you're really at that critical moment before you do swallow the pills or, you know, before you get to that point, call 911. They do have uh, people that specialize in speaking with you and can direct you to resources, often free resources, and not just 911, especially with COVID. You've had a lot of churches and temples and mosques that have made free services available, right. um, or, or they're on a sliding scale depending on what you're able to afford. Don't assume that you can't access those resources because you're out of work or because you have an elderly parent you're caring for and it's taking up all your resources. There are a lot of things that are available to you, especially because of COVID that weren't there before. So That's for true. any for anyone who is really going through a tough time, whether you're suicidal or not, if you really would need somebody to talk to, well, you have these other resources where you can speak to somebody who's not a member of your family, who That's doesn't right. live in your, in your neighborhood. So please reach out to those resources. Even if you don't, belong to a church, a temple, a mosque, you can still contact those organizations. They will help you. You know, I really like when my guests are willing to go as deep as John did and to really share their personal struggles and testimonies. Make sure to tune in next week where John and I will discuss more in depth his artistic endeavors and some of the projects that he's currently working on.